Okay, everyone, I think we'll get started. Happy Quality Day today. This is our second annual PCH Quality Day. And as you can see, we have um, some amazing posters on the um, left and right of myself. And uh, we're going to be having them up uh, for display until 1 o'clock. Please come back and join us um, around 11.30. We're going to have a poster presentation and some of um, our uh, uh, We'll also have some oral speakers as well on talking about their projects. It's pretty exciting. We had 73 um, abstracts submitted for Quality Day. Uh, definitely a huge record and it just um, embraces the culture of uh, quality and patient safety and our dedication to our patients and making sure that we're providing the best care possible here at Phoenix Children's. So thank you for all your participation and I'm coming here today for Grand Rounds. Uh, we actually have a pretty exciting topic for Grand Rounds. It's um, the next uh, frontier in patient safety, and that's diagnostic errors. Um, and uh, we heard, uh, the quality department heard a little bit of this um, topic yesterday, and it inspired me greatly, and I hope it inspires you as well. So uh, we're honored uh, today to have uh, Dr. Andrew Olson, from, uh, assistant professor in um, hospital and pediatric medicine from the University of uh, Minnesota here with us. And he is a nationally recognized uh, leader on diagnostic safety. And he's gonna be sharing this topic with us today. Please help me welcome Dr. Andrew Olson. Well. Thank you for that. It's always nice when they clap before your talk in case you don't clap at the end. So thank you. Thank you for the invitation for being here. And I'm really delighted to be here. Um, great to see a full room of folks for um, what I hear is a, a really exciting event. I walked around and looked at the posters this morning uh, as we got here. And it's really amazing to me. I practice at a children's hospital. It looks a little bit like this one. Uh, it's a little colder where I live. Uh, and found out that, that, that many of the challenges are the same and exciting to see people working on things. And so know that you know, your journey to quality and safety uh, is one that's shared across the country. Um, I'm, I'm excited to, to share what I, what I do with you, um, not because to talk about what I do, but to inspire you on your journey to making the diagnostic process safer. Uh, diagnosis, actually, whether you're a physician, whether you're a nurse, whether you're another healthcare professional, uh, diagnosis is the most important thing we do. I, I really believe that, that everything we do in healthcare is predicated on the right diagnosis. And so if we don't get that right, it's pretty hard to do the rest of the job right as well. And so my goal is to invite you to have a conversation over the next hour or so to think about that, think about how we can make this process better. Uh, and I put to you that it's infinitely improvable. The good news about getting into this field is I found out there's a lot of work to do uh, and it's not gonna be done anytime soon. Uh, so I don't have any uh, conflicts of interest. And my goal, these are my objectives uh, today to talk about why, why diagnostic errors happen, what leads to them happening. Uh, and uh, newsflash, it's not because nobody's trying hard. It's not that. Uh, discuss different strategies for measuring diagnostic performance. So how well do we know what we're doing? I think that's a real challenge. Uh, we talked about that a lot with your quality department yesterday, but I invite you to think about that a little bit. And then the bulk of the second half of what we're going to do is talk about what we can actually do today. Uh, imagine many residents are feeling the urge to go around. I get that. Uh, and hopefully we'll give you some strategies to walk away with. But the world actually never changed with statistics. It's never happened in the whole world. Uh, in fact, the, the statistics have never changed anyone's behavior, but what changes people's behavior uh, and inspires us and sometimes gives us pause as stories. So I want to tell you the story of Julia. So Julia is a 15-year-old girl uh, who lived in Minnesota who uh, got tired and had some dark urine. Her family was getting ready to go on vacation, uh, and so they took her in to the pediatrician uh, and saw a different, different partner than they usually see. Uh, and did some evaluation and, and subsequently found some pyuria and diagnosed Julia with a urinary tract infection, discharged her home. She didn't feel much better. She kind of got more tired. Uh, and she had a bit of a sore throat. And, and subsequently, uh, the family was getting ready to go on their vacation and they said, let's just take you into the pediatrician to check, to check before we go on the vacation. The pediatrician saw her and said, you know, she doesn't look great, but she doesn't look toxic. But uh, when she was getting up on the exam table, um, they noted really marked right upper quadrant tenderness. It's kind of odd in a 15-year-old girl. And so they said, we're going to send you across town to our children's hospital where you're actually going to have a right upper quadrant ultrasound. So they sent her over. They got the ultrasound in a somewhat expedited manner. And the ultrasound showed that she had fluid around her gallbladder and a swollen gallbladder. Labs revealed an elevated white blood cell count. And given the combination of fever, 
elevated white blood cell count, and evidence of a swollen gallbladder, she was presumptively diagnosed uh, with cholecystitis. There's some things that didn't necessarily fit along the way. Uh, for example, her platelets were low. Yeah, that doesn't really go with that. And, and she had some elevations in some of her, her liver enzymes. And the decision was made to proceed in, in through this hospitalization and, and trying to evaluate, you know, what's going on? Well, wh why does she have this? Because there's a lot of people standing around saying this doesn't make sense. That this 15-year-old girl, without any reason to have stones or, or a, a, a hemoglobinopathy, why would she develop cholecystitis? That doesn't really fit. Subsequently, uh, she underwent an ERCP to look for stones. The ERCP was normal. The gastroenterologist sat down with the family and said, you know, this doesn't make a lot of sense, but maybe the stones are tiny. And they had a conversation with the surgeon the next day. Her platelets recovered enough that they thought it was safe to do an operation. So they took Julia to the operating room uh, where they subsequently removed her gallbladder. It was uncomplicated. Uh, but in the PACU, uh, Julia developed overwhelming DIC. Uh, he had many transfusions and subsequently coded and died the same day. After an autopsy revealed that Julie actually never had cholecystitis, she had mono with EBV hepatitis. It's not our common diagnosis, but mono is. How did this happen? How did this happen? I tell you this story not to make us feel, but to say, how does this happen? We learn from stories. And this, uh, Julia's family uh, is an, um, are amazing people. Uh, and they committed their life uh, to improving diagnosis after their daughter died, and to Julia's memory. So when I talk about Julia nationally, I tell them that Julia is making a difference. Um, but, but what can we learn from this case? There's a lot we can learn from this case. Um, and Julia's dad wrote this article, and I don't know if anyone's seen this. It was an academic pediatrics, and his name wasn't on it originally. But I'm actually going to read this quote from it to talk about, uh, to read two quotes to launch our work. For what it's worth, as a layman and a father who's relayed countless times the six days before his daughter's death, here's what I find to be the common denominator. Everyone involved in Julia's care gave someone else the benefit of the doubt. The gastroenterologist seated to the surgeon, our pediatrician to the specialist, the surgeon to the anesthesiologist, the PACU nurse to the sixth floor nurse, we Julia's parents to the whole system. But isn't the fundamental building block of, collabor fundamental building block of collaborative care trust? How can the system function without interdependent web of expertise? Don't you strive for and ultimately depend on a team of qualified experts, the doctors, technicians, and nurses, as well as the families who know their children best. There is so much knowledge, so much capacity, so much data. Yet with all these assets, the chance for confusion, miscommunication, and conflicting analysis remain, or maybe be enhanced. In medicine, a field like no other in its capacity to intervene between life and death, maybe it's time to re-examine the value of doubt in the diagnostic equation. Do we stop and say, what if I'm wrong? Do we ask each other, what if we're wrong? What if we are wrong? Do we acknowledge that? So the, the, I'm going to give you a lot of numbers, but one's the one that matters. It's the patient that you're going to go see today that you might make a difference for and identify that they don't have what you think you have or, or maybe that our diagnosis is wrong. It's one story, and I encourage you all to, to state every person in this room will likely be affected somewhere in your family by a diagnostic error somewhere in your life. What's the Institute of Medicine says. I encourage you to hold those stories though and share those stories because stories change things. Julia's care changed the healthcare system in Minnesota. Um, and I find that there's probably stories here that can change your system as well. So what am I talking about, the diagnostic process? The diagnostic process is, is, is how we arrive at figuring out what's wrong with the patient. And when I think about the diagnostic process, my brain as a hospice goes to rounds. Right, I walk in and my students have, are telling me this thing in this order that they're lab laboriously put together. Uh, and then we arrive at a thing, and I tell the patient what they have. It's this magical moment. It turns out, though, the diagnostic process is a lot bigger than that. And on your left, it starts with the patient engaging with the healthcare system. And this speaks to social determinants of health and the need for advocacy in pediatrics. If you think about, there's really no reason that a kid should need to present with really severely uncontrolled asthma for months. But they do if they don't have access to care. The diagnosis looks different. We know that di di diseases present differently in people who present uh, who have less access to care. The circle in the middle is actually where we spend most of our time in healthcare, though. It's this iterative cycle of data gathering, data testing, assigning working diagnosis, and subsequently moving on. And, and this is where we spend most of our time, and this is where we spend most of our effort. 
Uh, interestingly, though, it's often idiosyncratic, and the way the Jen would do it is different than the way, way I would do it, than the, different than the way Joe would do it. I know Joe, he was my partner in Minnesota. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so it's idiosyncratic and it's different, and how do we look at that? Um, but the two most important diagnostic tests of all are time and response to treatment. But what's interesting is how often do we stop to say, my treatment isn't working, my antibiotics aren't working, instead of switching the antibiotics, maybe I say, maybe it's not infectious or it's not what I think it is. That's striking. But there's this part in the middle that we do very poorly, even in pediatrics, where I think we do a really good job with communication with families. Do we tell people what's wrong with them? Do we communicate the diagnostic process? Uh, residents, do you have morning reports? Good morning report. How often do you tell the families that you've talked about in my morning report? Patients love to hear that we've talked about your, we've thought really hard about your case. Patients want to do that. They don't know that five minutes we're in the room doesn't really seem like much. It's nice for them to know that we're spending a lot of time outside thinking about them. The other really striking thing to consider as well is that in healthcare, we don't know our outcomes. We know our outcomes for some stuff. We know our outcomes for, for readmissions, mortality, patient experience. Uh, we're doing some stuff with opiates nationally, right? There's a lot of data that's collected, but in the most important thing we do, diagnosis, we actually don't track it at all. If you want to know how good you are at pneumonia, try to find that number. Everybody thinks they're great at it, but we don't know. So how can we start to develop a system that allows us to know what we're doing and track those outcomes? So what's a diagnostic error? The Institute of Medicine defines it this way, is the failure to establish an accurate and timely definition uh, explanation for a patient's health problem or communicate that to the family. I make the joke that if a diagnosis is made in the forest and no one's there to hear it, it doesn't matter. Right? We make diagnoses for two reasons. One of those reasons is to inform treatment, but the other reason is to inform prognosis, to tell someone this matters for your life going forward and I'm going to be able to make decisions with you in your life going forward. We don't make diagnoses for us, we make it for them. I was in a meeting where we had a whole debate about who owns a diagnosis and uh, to me it's not a debate, it's the patient. Right? It's the patient and their family. That's what it's about. It's about finding out uh, what's wrong, how to move forward. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this definition works terribly for research. Uh, so many of us researchers use, use a missed opportunity to make a diagnosis. Could we have done better? And I actually like that because it is not about calling it right or wrong. It is not about saying you were wrong, you were right, you were wrong. It's about saying what can we do to improve the process so that maybe Julia's diagnosis could have been different. It's an infinitely improvable process. Many people also use the definition of missed, wrong, or delayed. The hard part is there's no given standards for how long it should take to diagnose something. Uh, I'd like to tell the story from my, my adult medicine time in medical school where my service had four patients with pulmonary emboli. It's kind of interesting. Um, and each of them took between three and four days to get diagnosed. And I just thought it took three or four days to diagnose a pulmonary embolism. For those of you physicians in the room, you know it doesn't. In fact, it does not take three or four days. I just thought that was normal. So we don't even know what's normal. We don't know what the optimal timing is. How fast should we diagnose things? Um, the other thing is I pay great attention to is the idea of overdiagnosis. We have to be very careful not assign labels that don't matter. We need to not define diseases that maybe in kids get labeled as that and they don't have that and it really impacts them. There's been changes in the insurance industry that have made that less impactful, but I think we have to really think hard about that and not increase expenditures as we think about improving the diagnostic process. So I summarize all this, though, to thinking about the paradigm of diagnostic safety. Instead of getting it right or wrong, how do we be safe in the process? Take, for example, the six-day-old little baby who comes in with a fever from home. What's the diagnosis? Resonance. What's the, what's the working diagnosis? Did I hear a rule out sepsis? Good. That works. That is a safe diagnosis that day. Maybe sepsis. Kid who's toxic comes into the ER, looks like they have sepsis, maybe bloodstream infection. That's okay that day. The problem is when we don't modify those or when we assign something that the patient has just to give it a name. I feel badly for my colleagues in the emergency department who have to assign a diagnosis to get somebody into the hospital because the point of diagnosis in the emergency department is not to say that's what that patient has. It's to make a really difficult, sometimes life-changing triage decision. But it's not assigning a value to that. I think when my poor colleagues in the emergency department have to put, you know, and there's all these boxes, we have EPIC, and so you have to like click, like you say click pneumonia and ask you like seven other questions, and like left lower lobe pneumonia due to streptococcus pneumoniae in an infant three to six months or something like that. I'm like pretty sure we're not that specific today, right? But you have to click that stuff, 
And so I think sometimes we can think of, invite ourselves into a conversation about safety. And I came to talk about this at your safety day because I think really the next frontier in how we make care better, safer, and actually more equitable as well as more affordable is to improve the diagnostic process. And we do that by thinking about safety. So how common are diagnostic errors? Uh, I think that this is one of those things that introspection is difficult uh, to think about. And it's, there was an institution that did a survey of their providers. They said, hey, do you want to find out about diagnostic errors? They said, everybody said yes. And they said, do you want to talk about yours? And they said no, right? Everybody wants to talk about your errors, right? My errors. You don't want to talk about mine. I'm going to invite us to talk about ours. And that's perhaps one of the most important cultural things we can do. So this story, though, finding out how common diagnostic errors starts in the early 90s with the, and I talked about this yesterday, about the most important patient safety study, I really believe, of the 20th century. This is the Harvard Medical Practice Study. The study surveyed, uh, reviewed about 30,000 random charts uh, from New York State hospitals and identified that adverse events are common. Um, and this founded, found, was foundational for much of the work that subsequently, subsequently led to the T. Ares Human Report. Um, but this report set up the idea that what you can do is you can review charts and retrospectively identify that things could have gone better. Uh, you'll note Lucian Leap is probably the father of patient safety, uh, who's the first author here. Um, and so, so this set up the, the, the work for subsequent studies that showed that between 10 and 20 percent of, of uh, diagnoses in the hospital are in error. As my first resident told me, though, you just don't know which 10 or 20 percent. That's the problem. So between 10 to 20 percent, if you're rounding on 10 patients, that means two, one to two of them, probably the diagnosis might be wrong. That's striking. That number's been very durable. It's been, in kids and adults, that number's been, it, been pretty solid across time. An autopsy study actually revealed in the ICU that there's actually probably about a third of patients have a substantial diagnostic error in adults who have an autopsy. Of course, this is a different population than the general population, but still, it's a prevalent problem. How, how about in pediatrics? If you ask pediatricians, how common are diagnostic errors that you see in your practice? The top is, is diagnostic errors irregardless of patient harm. The bottom, the bottom graph is diagnostic errors that led to harm. And they actually ask different groups. They ask community pediatricians, academic pediatricians, and trainees. What's striking to me is that the trainees notice the ones a lot on the top, but everybody sees diagnostic errors a couple times a month. What's striking to me is, when's the last time we told somebody about it? When's the last time we talked about it? These are the errors that feel different. Medication errors are a solvable problem, I firmly, firmly believe. And those of you who have been involved in a medication error, I heard some dose range checking was done here and some systems built. That's awesome. When a medication error happens, you can usually put the pieces together to figure out what happened. Six or eight reasons that that happened. You go through the root cause analysis, you can place the whole thing and figure out why it happened. The trouble is, if we look at Julia's case, it's pretty hard to figure out exactly what happened because a lot of the thinking that goes to diagnosis happens between my own two ears. We don't know. It's hard to know what you were thinking when. What did you know when, right, is, is a really important thing. And so errors are common. Errors also we can look at, though, from a, from a uh, point looking at specific diseases. And I'm going to show you a little bit of adult data here because I think it's important and informs the discussion. Spinal epidural abscess is a relatively difficult diagnosis to make, but not impossible. It requires index of suspicion and the right imaging test. However, who gets spinal epidural abscesses are people often who inject things into their veins. Okay? What's striking to me is that in this study, reviewing records of patients with spinal epidural abscesses, about half of them had a delayed diagnosis. It took three times as long. So maybe those are atypical. Maybe those are weird cases. Maybe, you know what, it's just the atypical cases we miss. Maybe that's the problem. Not true. And in fact, in this study, it actually showed the patients who had a delayed diagnosis actually had more red flag symptoms. They were sicker. They were very typical. My gut feeling is, if you look at the cases, though, that they were also people who had something else that make us think differently about them. Injection drug use. Maybe the patient was a jerk. Stuff like that. So diagnosis, I've told you, is the most important thing we do. It ranges between 10 and 20 percent of inpatients, 5 percent of outpatients. It's a striking prevalent problem. But this is our course calendar from the University of Minnesota Medical School the first year. There's no diagnosis course, which is striking. There's a few medical schools around that have a diagnosis course. Those of you physicians in your hand, if you had a course called Diagnosis or Clinical Reasoning, raise your hand. A couple, a few, not nearly as many as we should, and it's the most important thing we teach. 
That's because we teach it primarily through apprenticeship is the way we teach it. And we don't often come back to consider. And so I think we need to fundamentally change medical education to think about starting with symptoms and how do we find out what's wrong with patients because that's your most important job. So why do these errors occur though? I told you it happens between your own two ears much of the time in a complex chaotic system. And all human cognition occurs within a system. And we know that when this system is not controlled and the system has chaos in it, and even a high-functioning children's hospital like Phoenix Children's, there's a certain element of chaos on it. I think I saw actually chaos on one of the, the, the posters here. And we know that the chaos associated, the perception of chaos in a hospital units is associated with adverse events. But we are people doing what I actually think, and I, and I will, if somebody can prove me wrong, I'd love to, but I actually think phys, uh, uh, diagnosis is the most difficult human task we do cognitively. I, you know, it's pretty interesting. If you think about all the things that patients can come to you with, and you have to find out what's wrong, you don't get to control it, it's really striking to think about that it's not like playing chess or playing the violin where you do the same thing over and over and over and over with practice and feedback. It's idiosyncratic. And how many of you have walked in as attendings 10 or 20 years into your practice and you see a disease you've never seen before? That's amazing. What an opportunity. You know, even, even the aviation industry from which we can draw a lot of lessons uh, in safety actually falls apart a little bit because the variables are somewhat controlled in aviation. People ain't airplanes is what I like to say. So why do, why do these errors happen though? And I want to talk about this, that if we look at, this is a, a figure from some a really foundational work in 2005 that shows that actually diagnostic errors occur due to two reasons, the combination of systems and cognition. The effect of human cognition on system, excuse me, the effect of, of systems on human cognition. And about three quarters of the time it involves both cognitive errors and system errors. And thus, a really effective strategy has to be different than it is with medication errors, where it's primarily system fixes. We have to have cognitive fixes as well. The challenge with cognitive fixes is, what's the most common cognitive fix that you get as a medical student when you don't know something? Go read more. Try harder. Right? And the worst quality improvement strategy in the whole world is the try harder strategy. Right? It just doesn't work. You can, everybody's trying their hardest. I didn't wake up today saying I'm not going to do my best. And so, so when we look at this cognitive side, though, I want to spend a bit of time talking about the cognitive side of this. I'm worried every day that I don't know enough. I am terrified that I don't know enough. But it turns out that much of the sources of diagnostic error isn't not knowing facts. It's not that you didn't read that last paper. It's not that you skipped that day in medical school. Well, you, that might be a problem if you skipped that day in medical school. But, but what's striking is, is how we put the pieces together. It's synthesis of problems. The most common reason that people miss a diagnosis is they didn't think of it. Why would we not think of it if I knew it? I told a story yesterday of a case of bacterial tracheitis that I missed. I saw a kid who I thought had croup, kid had bacterial tracheitis. I knew plenty about both of those diseases. It wasn't a knowledge problem at all. In fact, it was how I put the pieces together that it didn't stimulate, bring to mind. And the reason that things don't come to mind is this. What you learned in high school economics probably was wrong. So, so Joe, did you take high school economics? No. <laughs> we'll talk later. Uh, uh, so so what, what are some of the things you learned? You learned supply and demand. Uh, you learned the idea of, of scarcity. And then you learned the idea that people will behave rationally with their money. Right, that people will put needs before wants and that people will spend money in a rational way. The last time I went shopping, it's very clear that the companies know that isn't true. For example, do there's, is there Kohl's in Arizona? Is there Kohl's? All right. So I shop at this little boutique called Kohl's, right? <laughs> and so, and so there, there's, if you're in, in Minnesota, you wear these things called sweaters. Uh, and so, uh, so the sweaters on the top are $80 sweaters that are discounted to $39.99. And the bottom ones are $39.99 sweaters every day. All of you are going to buy the top sweater. That's crazy. That number means nothing. An $80 sweater isn't necessarily better than a $39 sweater. They just know. That's why Kohl's has sales all the time, right? So it's, it's amazing. Human cognition, you've actually anchored on this thing. It's anchoring. You've anchored on this idea of this number. Think about if you heard in a case that a kid had a fever. They never did. But that kid comes in with hyperbilirubinemia, a newborn. It's really hard to get that work rule out sets this thing out of your mind, even though they never had a fever. It's amazing. We anchor on stuff all the time. How many of you hear a story on NPR when you drive in, and you're like, wow, 
I came up today. That's amazing. It's because it's available. It anchors in your mind. Humans do that all the time. This is natural human behavior. It works most of the time. If diagnoses are wrong 10 to 20% of the time, it means 80 to 90% of the time they're right. It means the processes work most of the time. Momentum's huge. Think about this. Kid gets seen in the emergency department and assign a diagnostic label. Is there a differential diagnosis in the chart actually after that kid gets admitted or do we just trust the ER? The ER didn't intend to make a specific diagnosis. In fact, they, if you asked them, they were like, no, I didn't really mean that at all, right? They said, in fact, I, I just really wanted to get the kid in the hospital because that was the right decision. Diagnostic momentum is amazing. Uh, one thing we underuse in the EMR, the whole, the, the, um, Larry Weed, when he talked a lot about the role of the EMR originally in, in problem-based charting in the 70s, talked about the need to, for problem-based charting um, and the idea that problemless are key. I don't know about you, but problemless maintenance in our EMR is pretty terrible. For example, if you blow in the past medical history, how many 12-year-olds have neonatal hyperbilirubinemia on their list? Right? I'm pretty sure that's not the problem today. Pretty sure, guys. In fact, it doesn't matter. When's the last time you took something off? It's really hard to unmake a diagnosis. Think about that. It's way easier to make it than it is to unmake it, to refute a diagnosis, to stop believing something. We as humans also are wired to think about how pieces fit. It is really difficult if I told you that this piece doesn't fit. It's uncomfortable. You'd be annoyed at me. You'd be like, well, yeah, maybe there's something sticking out under that, that top piece, but, but no, it fits. We look for the pieces that confirm our beliefs. Think about this, whatever your political leanings, when you listen to someone giving a speech, whether you disagree or agree with them, you will pick out the parts that, that reaffirm your beliefs, right? And in fact, what do humans do when presented with conflicting information from someone you believe? You believe it harder. Amazing, so that's confirmation. Representativeness is huge. Representativeness is the idea that we will see things as a prototypic case and leave out stuff that's not typical all the time. If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's usually a duck, but sometimes it's not. So we think about, we put, place, we put the, the conditions into our boxes of prototypes, which is important, but sometimes we don't pay attention to the things that doesn't fit. Blind obedience as well. We really trust tests. We trust them a lot. When's the last time we considered the imaging could just be wrong? All the time it happens. It's amazing, there's an error rate. And I think in pediatrics especially though, so we trust tests in a huge way. And that's okay, but we need to sometimes question them. But who do we really trust in pediatrics? Is we trust experience and specialists. And I hold great regard for my specialist experienced colleagues. However, we have to remember to practice evidence, not eminence-based medicine, right? To think about that sometimes that intern who spent eight hours with that patient knows something that really informs the care that the specialist didn't know. We need to have a culture of questioning, of dogging each other and saying, what else could it be? They do this in the Australian military, where they actually have a, 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 a system to break down some of the hierarchy and talk about uh, in, in simulation before they go out on a, on a mission called the red team, blue team, where they say, one team presents the plan, the other team tries to rip it apart. What if we did that? What if we had a culture of questioning? When I round with my internal medicine residents, it's really routine that I get questioned on rounds. Residents, I encourage you in pediatrics, even though the attending experience, ask them questions, challenge, say, what if we're wrong? What else could it be? Ask that to your specialist all the time. Not to be difficult, it might be difficult, but it might be you stimulate thinking. The other thing is visceral bias. The way we feel matters a lot. So, think about this. You're rounding, and you walk into the room of a kid where with an asthma exacerbation, it's the third one in three months. The room smells like smoke. How are you feeling? Kind of annoyed. If I asked you, how much does that family read to their kids? What would you say? You'd probably say less. We feel and we make assumptions all the time, and there's no study showing those things are related. We are human. We make decisions based on biased information. And you know what? That's human. We need to pay attention to when that happens, but we also really importantly need to be able to speak to that and say, you know what? This family was mean to me yesterday, and I'm really worried that I'm not going to be able to think about this going in the right way. This family reminds me of my family. This kid reminds me of my kid. It goes positive as well. What if it's somebody I really like? My brain won't consider that they could have something really bad. My brain won't consider that they could have cancer. It just won't come to mind. This is not volitional stuff. This is actually how we're hardwired and we need to start talking about it because one of the ways to overcome some of these biases is to talk about it in a team. 
Medicine, especially pediatrics, is a team sport that involves families, involves every healthcare professional on the team. And we have to think about getting it out there because then we can improve the diagnostic process. This is my favorite quote. I really love baseball. Uh, and Bob Feller, who's from Iowa, like me, says that I think about baseball when I wake up in the morning. I think about it all day and I dream about it at night. The only time I don't think about it is when I'm playing it. How often is that true in your job? You go through your day and your brain turns on on your way home or when you're laying down to go to sleep or the next day or for me, when I'm running. How often do those patients come to mind that I actually never stop to consider? I was on autopilot throughout the day. How often do we make diagnoses on autopilot? Think about that during RSV season. Um, and I think especially during the influenza pandemics that we see. I was a resident uh, during one of the, the bigger outbreaks. And I can't imagine how many things I just explained with H1N1. Like, it turns out like H1N1 doesn't really cause a lot of the symptoms I, told it, I said it did. But I thought everybody had it, right? <laughs> And I just wasn't thinking, I was on autopilot. And so how do we get out of the autopilot? What are some things that we can do to make the diagnostic process better? Julia's case, people were thinking hard, but it was a little bit autopilot because they said she has cholecystitis instead of this is a child with elevated liver enzymes, hyperbilirubinemia, right upper quadrant tenderness, fever. What else could it be? What else could it be? We need to think about getting past these automatic things or making the automatic things we do better. So don't be the same. We're going to be better. I'm going to talk now about what we can do to improve the process because that's the, the people who work in this field of diagnostic care are the most inspiring people I know um, because they really believe this process is improvable and we can make a big difference. So first of all, I need to talk to very briefly what I'm talking about. So there's the idea of diagnosis as noun. It's something. It's a thing that we do to patients. It is I assign a diagnosis to explain what's wrong. But it's also a process that we can think about. And sometimes, even if you don't have the outcome measure, this is safety day, so we're going to talk about structure process outcomes. If we don't have the outcome measure, which we don't, we're trying to get it, we're working really hard on measuring diagnostic outcomes, we need to focus on the process a little bit because there are breakdowns in the process that happen. Some of those breakdowns are simple system things that are not simple at all. Lab test turnaround, communication of test results. Where else in your life do you have to get information, life or death information, with a fax machine? That's crazy, right? I mean, it's just crazy if you stop and consider it. Like, there's no reason that needs to occur. That, that we know that EHR interoperability between systems is associated with decreased mortality at the time of transfer. If your EMR and my EMR talk to each other in a fully interoperable way, your risk of mortality after transfer is lower. That's striking. If information is lost or gained at the time of transfer, that is, your chronic diagnosis on the problem list shouldn't change at the time of a transfer. There's no reason that you should acquire atrial fibrillation or cerebral palsy um, in the time of a transfer, right? That's just not a thing. But if you gain or lose diagnoses at the time of transfer, it's associated with mortality. Information matters. We live in an information world. We need to think about how healthcare can start to keep up. I think we are right for disruptive innovation um, in the field of EMRs. Unfortunately, there's some actors that play economically that make that difficult, but it's coming. The idea that we, when patients start to own their medical records, and interoperability becomes less of an issue. So how do we get better? I'm going to talk a lot about the diagnostic process and think a little bit about outcomes. Number one, we have to look for our own errors and talk about them, talk about them, talk about them, talk about them. I see some experienced folks in the crowd. The most important thing you can do is tell your stories. You'll change an institution. Our residency program changed overnight when one of our really experienced clinicians got up. She wasn't even on a panel um, that we were talking about during one of our curricula around diagnostic care, she got up and said, told a story from 30 years ago about a case that she missed. It made it okay to talk about it. It's humbling to talk about errors. It's humbling to stand here and tell you I missed a case of bacterial tracheitis. It's humbling to talk about that the healthcare system missed EBV, hepatitis. But we have to do it. We have to tell stories. You have to learn from them. We learn from that. We have to give and get feedback always. The most important thing in changing human behavior is giving and get feedback. Ask what if. I want you to try this on rounds. Try, ask what if. Say, I don't know. I actually think uncertainty is one of the most important things to do, uh, to acknowledge. And in medical education, and I don't know how nursing education is, but in medical education, we train the I don't knows out of you. We give you lots of multiple choice tests, and you assume that there's an answer all the time. You get into medical school by taking this MCAT, then you go through and you take your test during your first two years, you take a USMLE exam, and then you get to the ward, and often the right answer is, I don't know. I don't know yet. 
I don't know what this is. I'm going to be with you in it. Isn't that amazing that we go and actually we get way less certain as we go? I know as I've gone through my practice, I'm way more comfortable talking about I don't know and then expanding the diagnostic team. So I'm not a basketball fan, but this is a great quote by Michael Jordan. Right, that said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I failed over and over and over, and that's why I succeed. You gotta learn from it. And it's not just that you tried over and over, it's you learn from those opportunities. And we need to learn from every time something could have gone better, we need to learn from it. We can do that. It's an impro infinitely improvable process. And, so I speak to the senior clinicians in the room. If we're not being an example of this, we're being the example of not being this. People look to you to tell stories, to be humble. If there's one, one trait that's, that's very clear to me that I want in my expert clinicians is confident humility. Sometimes we have to proceed in the face of uncertainty, absolutely. But we need to be confident in our ability to say, I don't know and I'm okay with that and we're gonna work together on it. We need to give feedback. Feedback is, to me, the most important promising strategy because I don't know if the human brain can stop being biased. A lot of debate about this, and this goes to political realms and everything like that. I don't know if the human brain can do that. The studies and diagnosis focusing on debiasing have been somewhat disappointing to date. But what is the way to change my behavior is to tell me the outcomes of my behavior. Every human decision has three potential outcomes. It's either favorable or expected. It's unexpected or unfavorable or it's unknown. This is the process of calibration. We make a decision. If it's a favorable outcome, we do the exact same thing. We'll do the same next time. Think about driving. We all drive on autopilot all the time, right? Like not like the Tesla autopilot, but like on your brain autopilot, right? And so when you drive on that, if, you, if nothing goes wrong and you're not presented with any information that you're not doing something the right way, you're going to do the exact same thing the next day. However, has anybody had your blinker burn out? Right? So when you flip on your blinker, it makes that really annoying, like fast click noise. And then you're like, oh my gosh, I turned my blinker on. I haven't thought about turning my blinker on for years. Like, what was that? You stop and you recalibrate. You're unexpected. And you make a different decision next time. However, the human brain is wired evolutionarily to say that unknown outcomes are treated as favorable. We are hardwired to believe that no news is good news. That's not true. No news is no news. And in fact, how many people have told a patient in the last year that no news is good news? Right? Totally. And that's just not a thing. No news is no news. So, so, so how, how, does this, how do we think about this in healthcare? We do a lot of work. I heard you're an iPass uh, site. You're working on imp implementing iPass for forward flow of information. We spend millions of dollars in this country looking at forward flow of information in healthcare. I just told you two minutes ago that's really important. However, every one of these systems is lacking because they don't give information back. And the most important educational opportunity we have in our practice is learning from our patients. So how do we think about feeding not information only forward, but feeding it back? The transition of care. We have residents admit patients at night, transitions them to the daytime. Wow, do we have an opportunity to maybe give feedback about what that patient had at night when in, in the light of day? Is that an opportunity? Do we do that 100% of the time? Totally not, right? Our residents, our residents don't know what happened the next day. It's not their fault, it's not that they're not trying hard. Similarly to the ED, our ED providers are hungry to know what happened to their patients, hungry to know. They really wanna know the outcomes. It lets you fill out the illness script to say, you know what, I didn't know that disease could present that way. I'll think of that next time. We have to be able to give feedback to it. Why it doesn't, the admission rate in most pediatric hospitals is relatively low in the total number of the number of kids you're gonna admit per shift as an emergency medicine provider is a manageable number. What if you were copying down the discharge summary? Some places do that, some don't. But what if you had an opportunity to actually just review for two minutes? Oh, that's what that patient had. Good catch. You're gonna be right 80, 90% of the time. What about admission H&P to discharge H&P? Like, could I get that? Same thing, that, that I, I think there's real value in that. I think the most important feedback to get though is from the first outpatient follow-up visit. Because those of you who practice primary care pediatrics, and I know there are some of you connected virtually as well, know that sometimes the world looks a lot different when you're not at a tertiary care children's hospital. And so do we ever get feedback from that provider about what we did? Sometimes we're really ripe to give feedback to the person who referred them to us. Yeah, like, oh, you missed that. But what about, but, but what about the opportunity for them to tell us what we could have done differently in the hospital? Wouldn't that be cool? What about an opportunity for them? And then readmission. 
Do we know about readmissions all the time? Are you notified every time somebody gets readmitted that you cared for? Yes, that's awesome. That's awesome. And I encourage one of the things to consider there is when that happens, say, might my diagnosis have been wrong? That is a place ripe for study, that we know that readmissions probably a significant portion of the time have some diagnostic modification to happen. I stink at golf. I really do. I really like to play golf. And so you're like, why do you stink at golf? It's because I have not worked hard on getting better. Um, and I think that the only way to get better is through feedback. But I'm going to talk a little bit about that because it's specific. Who's read this book? Outliers. And what, what do you remember? So, do you want me to shout out something you remember from it? 10,000 hours. All right. So perfect. 10,000 hours. Malcolm Gladwell says that the number of hours you need to become an expert is 10,000 hours. That he's work, quoting the work of a guy named Anders Ericsson, who's a behavioral econ economist. That's one word I just can never say, despite having given it like 50 talks. Um, uh, but he actually looked at people getting into professional violin school. How long it took you to get good enough to get into violin school? And it actually ranged between seven and 17,000 hours, and it had nothing really to do with the hours. It was what you put into them. It's about deliberate practice. It's not about practice. In fact, I think we actually perform medicine, we don't practice it. We just do it and we don't get feedback. It's amazing to me. That's the only field of human performance where we operate without knowing our outcomes. And it's actually striking and immoral. So as we develop expertise over time, the whole goal of medical education is to develop expertise, to turn you into experts. Same with nursing education, is to turn you into experts. Over time, if you just practice, you might get to here. If you work on something for a while, um, and then you're like, okay, I've attained competence, I'm good enough. I am a no better driver now than I was five years ago. I don't know about you, but I'm just not. I, I think a skill, I have arrested development. There's arrested development that comes with automaticity. And think about that in our practice. I think that's really true in a lot of areas of our practice. Think about things that we commonly manage, asthma, the febrile infant, all of those things that we manage. I think we probably get arrested. Expert performance requires deliberate practice and that you note that that curve actually doesn't flatten out over time. You can constantly get better. But it's got some specific things and the number one thing you have to know is you have to know your outcomes. So if we don't know how good we are, if we don't know the outcomes of our behavior, we can't ever get to be experts. Can we identify the experts? There's been some really nice work done nationally called a loop study to improve feedback for residents about how their patients did. It's a simple idea, but it's really important. The idea is that we want to close these loops. We want to stop having unknown outcomes. And just tell people, not that they were right or wrong, but just what happened. Because from daytime, from, excuse me, from night to day admission, what do people think? How often does the diagnosis change from night to day? If a resident admits a patient at night to the daytime, what percent? Nailed it, 40%. 40% of the time. We found that 56% of the time there was no change. 11% of the time the disease evolved, and that's really important to know. In the era of modern duty hours, they certainly probably have some cognitive benefits. If you aren't there to know that a disease evolves in X, Y, or Z way, you will not know what that disease looks like when it's evolved. So the disease evolves. There's diagnostic refinement. You go from sepsis to gram-negative sepsis, for example. That's important information to know. But about 12% of the time, there's a major change, suggesting that, that that first initial diagnosis was incorrect. What we did in this study is we just fed back the information. We just said this is what they had during the day. We all think we look in the chart after we work nights, or we think we look in the chart after we go off service. Um, and I like to think I do. I don't. Uh, if you look at this, there's data from emergency medicine studies that show that if you have a resident admit a patient from the emergency department uh, to the hospital, they look in the chart of that patient about 3% of the time. It's not that you're not trying hard, it's that we just don't know. We need to operationalize and systematize doing the right thing. Right? The quality and safety folks tell you that right, they tell you that all the time. That you need to systematize and make it easy to make the right choice. So if the right choice is looking in the charts, we can give you that information. So practice doesn't make perfect at all. It's not true. Practice with deliberate feedback and constant need to improve makes better. In fact, I actually really recommend this book. Has anybody read this book by, by Anders Ericsson? Um, so this is actually forms the basis for outliers. And I encourage you to read this book. It'll change your life, actually. It's about, about human performance and deliberate practice. And it really gets you actually really anxious if you don't know your outcomes, because you're like, I need to improve all the time. It's amazing. Actually, it's, and it's very easily written. You'll re read in a couple days. The idea of it is expertise. If you look at musical experts, so if you look at Yo-Yo Ma, 
one of the best cello players in the world, has three mental representations of how the process looks. They say, I know what it looks like on the top when I'm successful there. I know what this is going to look like when I'm successful. I know the steps to get there, and I know if I'm being, I know how to monitor myself as I go through. So how does that look in diagnosis? I know how this hospitalization, I think, will go. I can ballpark how this thing is going to go. If it went ideally, how would this pick you stay go? I know the next step to take, and I know to monitor when things might be going wrong. And do we have an ability to stop and monitor? Do we have a shared mental representation of what this should look like so that if something isn't the right way, we can communicate that back? Do we invite our nurses into that to say, this is what I'm expecting throughout the day. If this doesn't occur, please call me. Or do we invite our nurses to say, what doesn't fit in this for you? My next improvement strategy, though, is that. What if? What if, what if, what if? Because talking about things is so important. And it gets it out from your own two ears. When we start to talk about a diagnosis with a patient, when you have a conversation with a colleague about a diagnosis, it stopped being automatic because you have to use words. And automatic thinking doesn't use words. It's just deciding. So it's getting talking about it. That's why we need to involve t people in rounds. That's why getting other perspectives is so important. Ask what if. Students, I want you to ask these questions on rounds. Think about how this goes. What if it actually isn't RSV? What if it isn't Kawasaki disease? What if it isn't just a viral syndrome? Ask what if it isn't that. The important question is, the, the right response, by the way, attending is not, well, it is. Uh, the right response is, huh, let's think about that for a second. Let's take a time out and think about that. What if we're wrong? What if we're wrong? Sometimes, if you're wrong, and the kid's got a, 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 a nonspecific viral illness, and you're worried that you might be wrong because they've got otitis media, it's probably going to be OK. Right, but what if you're wrong? Ask yourself, what if I'm wrong? What could this be? We know high reliability organizations are think about that. What if we're wrong? What if we're wrong? What if the patient didn't have some of these things? What if the patient wasn't mentally ill? What if the patient didn't have an eating disorder? What if the patient didn't have a genetic syndrome? Turns out the kids with genetic syndromes get common things. It's not always related to the syndrome. Kids with congenital heart disease get normal kid stuff too. What if they didn't have that? What if they didn't have annoying parents? What off could this be? Really important. And what if that thing that doesn't fit really matters? Man, I can explain a lot of stuff with reflux, right? Like reflux cause everything, you know, like, <laughs> like everything. And it turns out that's probably not true. Same with constipation. You know, you're like, yeah, your kid's constipated, right? And I'm going to send you out. And, and it's amazing, these, the, this really elaborate description you can have for how constipation is causing the kid's knee pain, right? But like, sometimes we have to say, like, what doesn't fit? And if that thing doesn't fit, like that fever doesn't fit, or that weight loss doesn't fit, or that rash doesn't fit, sometimes just play with that. You don't have to do more tests. You just have to think about it. Have the cognitive exercise to invite a conversation that we might be wrong. So next is say I don't know. So anybody remember who, who's this quote from? The, we know what we know. We know there are things we do not know. And we know there are things we don't know we don't know. It's Donald Rumsfeld said this. Um, and, and I actually think he was actually right about this. Um, it's not a comment on anything else. So, so um, but, but the, the, this idea that there are facts we know in medicine, but there is a lot of other stuff that we just don't know, that we say, you know, this is uncertain. I don't know what it is today. Maybe I'll know tomorrow. But right, we need to acknowledge that to families. And sometimes we're in such a rush to resolve the uncertainty that we make bad decisions. And so how do we do that? It's because it's difficult. It's hard when the family's saying, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? And sometimes the right response there isn't giving them an answer. It's saying, I don't know yet. This is how we're going to get there. And I'll be with you. I actually think the response to much uncertainty is to say, I'm going to try to find the answer. And I'm going to be with you. It's empathy. It's not necessarily giving that answer. I know when the family's really pushing me for an answer and I don't want to give it, that's the time I need to sit down, lean in, and say, you know what? Let me explain this process to you. If we explain the diagnostic process to families, I think they're much more likely to give us a pass on not knowing that day. If we say, this is a really difficult task, let me help you understand how this information is going to come in. We did a study with our residents actually showing, can we improve their ability to convey I don't know to families? We gave them four scenarios um, with simulated patients where if they gave a diagnosis, they were wrong because there was not enough information to make the diagnosis. And the residents, all of them identified this incredibly powerful ability to have humility and the confidence to sit at a bedside and say, I don't know, and I'll be with you as we figure this out together. If we go off instead of I'm doing diagnosis for you, something we do together. Don Berwick says, nothing about me without me. 
And I really believe that. We need to invite people into that diagnostic decision-making process. Inform the parents. Tell them about that. And again, Dan Berg says we need to invite doubt. He used the word doubt instead of uncertainty. But what if we question? What if we say, it's okay to not know today? What if we tell our medical students, they're terrified of saying, I don't know. The residents are terrified of saying, I don't know. And yes, you need to know a lot. And some days I will be like, that's something you should know. But some days I'm going to say, thank you for telling me that. Can you find out that information? And there's some stuff we're never going to know. The why questions, the unanswerable questions. Think about the questions that come up in a care conference. Questions that you wish the chaplain was there to answer. Right? Sometimes we have this uncertainty that's unresolvable. And if we ignore that, if we ignore that little piece of you that says this doesn't fit, and I don't know, I don't know why, but it doesn't fit, if we ignore that, that's a problem. In fact, we're going to jump to conclusions. We're going to be overly confident. How many of you have colleagues, I bet, I'm not going to make you raise your hand because you're sitting next to them, uh, but you have colleagues who you're way more willing to say I don't know to than others. Guarantee it. I encourage you to think about why and how do you be a colleague that invites someone to have that conversation. I really think that uncertainty is going to be written about very, very, very significantly in the next few years. We're going to have curricula about it and talking about that. If we don't acknowledge the uncertainty in the process, bring people in and have shared uncertainty in it, we make problem. We make all sorts of diagnostic errors. And in fact, I think it just invites us to be better. It's way better as a family. You're sitting there three, four, five days and you're like, the doctors aren't doing anything. We're like, we're sitting there, we're like, we're trying our hardest. What if we told them what we're doing? Like, share that process with them. We can do that. Patients are at the center of the diagnostic process. They're families. They are the reason we're here. And so we need to invite them into that process. And so how do we do that? We do it by asking some questions. I invite you to ask these questions for these families. What doesn't fit for you in this? Think about that kid who's got a chronic problem, a kid who's got a trach and a G-tube. That kid's mom is probably an expert in that kid. You know, and certainly she may or may not have know what's going on medically, but her spidey sense is probably pretty good. And so what doesn't fit for you? It's amazing to me that people will bring up very specific things. Given your experience with, you, what, with this, what doesn't fit in our approach? And then what have you read? Okay. So I had a realization moment a few, a few years ago when my mom called me, and she finds it terribly depressing that I study diagnostic error, but she called me and she said, Andrew, I've been Googling my symptoms. If my <laughs> mother is Googling, everybody's doing it. Okay? So there are two potential things that what happens when a patient's family Googles their diagnosis. They're either right or they're wrong. And either way, it's important to know what they've read. Right? If they say, you know, I read that that coccidioid mycosis is an epidemic in Minnesota. That's not true, right? I read that. I need to correct that. Similarly, sometimes they found something that can really aid you. You're like, yeah, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought of that. It invites a conversation, but it invites them to say, what have you read about this? I think sometimes we're scared about that. We get annoyed. People go to, you know, crazyparent.com or whatever. We need to invite them to actually think about being part of the team. Uh, because, because the other important thing is people will type stuff in that search box that they won't tell you. Ask them, what would you Google? So I like to ask not only what would you read, but what did you Google? So those are some things that we can do to improve the diagnostic process. Diagnosis is the most important thing we do. It is improvable, and we need to start improving it. I commend you for this. I actually think that, 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 that baseball and medicine, I actually believe this as well, that you get to do something about it. Every day it's infinitely improvable. And so I invite you to, to think about that, think about how that looks from a system standpoint, how does the system aid physician cognition, how do you invite families into this uh, and make this a better and safer healthcare system for everyone? So thank you very much. I'm glad to take questions. That, that's a great, and thank you for bringing that up. So the point of, the question was, with respect to feedback, uh, we all want feedback till we find out we're wrong and it's uncomfortable and we get defensive. Um, and I think that speaks to the need to normalize it. Um, because right now, the only time my colleague comes and says, hey, do you remember that case? Is usually when I was wrong. And it's uncommon. And feedback right now, we were talking about peer review yesterday, feedback is a high acuity, infrequent event. And we need to turn it from the bullish approach to the, it's just what you get. The other thing is, if we change it so you get feedback more frequently, now you're actually finding out that you were right 80% of the time. 
And so we just have to normalize it. But right now, the only time somebody calls you, generally, or the way peer review systems work, is the only time you find out is when you were wrong. And so it feels, of course, you're gonna, if you're only presented with that. But we have to normalize it and, and, and build a culture of feedback. If you said, what is the most important thing that we could do based on this work? It's, it's that you normalize the way that you deliver feedback to each other. Just to say, hey, the diagnosis changed. You weren't right or wrong. The diagnosis changed. So important. Yeah, great question. Yeah, great question. Um, I'll, I'll take the fir first one. So, so how do we have these cognitive fixes be supported by the system? I'll rephrase your question. Uh, this is the one I want to answer. Uh, so I, the, 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 the politicians do that, right? They, they answer the question they want to answer. Uh, so um, I, I think that there's some things that w one can do. Um, I think that, for example, there's no reason that, you sh that the EMR can't require you to put a differential diagnosis in. Uh, uh, no, that's not the dot phrase differential diagnosis. I joked about this yesterday. RED folks have this dot phrase for abdominal pain that includes porphyria. And I'm like pretty sure they didn't think of that. And so, um, you know, I'm not, not getting down on them. But so I think, um, so, so I think that, that we can require some system things like that. Uh, you can require people to read the body of a radiology or lab uh, path report before they can see the impression. Uh, we can make it easier to access radiologists and lab professionals. Um, and you can institute some of the stuff on rounding. I think that if you, if you have a formal rounding structure, you can always say you know, that there is a patient that we need to take a diagnostic time out on. You can systematize that. Um, so, so I think there's EMR fixes that, that will help aid. Because right, I am a, uh, A, I just have a question. I don't know when we're going to stop calling the EMR and just the medical record, because you know, the E could drop at some point. But because uh, um, it's like the medical record now. Um, but I think that, that we, can, we can, right now, it is at best neutral in our diagnostic process. And, but I'm a real optimist, and I think we can make it, it aid the process much more. Um, I also think that we can engage systems. If the, the data being put in improves, then the data we get out to inform our practice based using AI and machine learning will help. I actually think that is necessary but not sufficient, and it's going to aid the cognition. The second one is, have we systematized the, the work around giving feedback to our ED colleagues. So, so we've still done it in our residency program. Uh, we, um, it's been difficult just because trying to figure out the right amount to deliver to the, to the ED providers. Very soon we are planning to hopefully turn on the discharge um, a notifier for them to say that your patient that you admitted was discharged. Um, and then I think the, the part about that is once you turn that on though, what do you do with it? Um, because often places do require a bit of reflection. Maine Medical Center uh, has done a lot of this work. Uh, and has actually requires a reflection of their hospitalists where they have a discharge and admission, uh, admi admission note discharge summary together. And they actually have to reflect uh, for uh, a few times a month on why they're different. Um, because reflection is probably one of the most important things in deliberate practice as well. Yeah, great question. So, so how do we uh, invite patients to be a member of the diagnostic team? And as part of that is, is, is kind of the quality assurance and making sure that the information conveyed and that we're operating on is accurate. Uh, I think that, yes, there is work on that. Uh, and, and a lot of that's been the open notes movement. Um, and so our hospital went to open notes, the idea that you give every patient their progress note every day. Um, and man, a lot of people were really upset before we did it. It's going to world ending, whatever, right? It was like the biggest meh ever. Um, it, it, it was fine. It's not, not to disparage it, but it's just not an issue. Um, and it really helps. Actually, people have corrected stuff for me. 
And so I actually think like, what if we gave them their discharge, printed discharge summary at discharge, not just the instructions, but the discharge summary um, that said, you know, does this seem right to you? This, you know, that, I think, yes, there is work at that. There, there's some initial thought about co-creation of medical records. Um, and, and that's been kind of experimental thus far, but how is it gonna be, I bet in 10 years, uh, a visit will have the patient filling out something in the EMR before they come to you. That, that you know, the only person who doesn't get put something in there right now is the patient, which is really interesting. Portals, portals have great profits, but they're one way, right? Like the parking app for Minneapolis is better than our portal app, right? I mean, so it's like, the, 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 so I think we can, that, that once it becomes a two-way co-creation, um, and I think that, that if we read about folks like Paul Patal and folks who really talk about co-creation, um, when we start to co-create diagnoses, that's when we're going to be there, and I think that's going to be co-creation of medical records. There's a lot of structural barriers to not do that right, uh, but I think the medical legal barriers will go away as well. Okay. There's one more question. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, the idea that if we deliver a diagnosis too early, the idea of premature closure, uh, if we give that diagnosis, patients come to us, especially someone who's been on kind of a, a diagnostic odyssey, if you will, they, they are, they're desperate for a name, right? You give this name to this thing. Um, think about that, those of you who do hemonc. Sometimes when you give that cancer diagnosis, it's a relief because their symptoms are explained. Um, and so we have to remember the power of diagnosis and the idea that when we assign a name to something that's been impacting someone's life, that has great power. And unmaking that's way harder than making it. Um, and so we can invite people to sometimes say, you know, I'm thinking this, but I need you to know I might be wrong. I've actually started to tell patients that the most important part of my job is being willing to say I'm wrong. Uh, and I think that's important to say that we're calling it this day, this, we're calling it this today, but there's probably, you know, there's, there's room for significant change afterwards. And, and inviting them into that as opposed to, we need to be clear, like, am I sure or not? We had a conversation yesterday about would it be possible uh, to, to have a slider bar in your EMR to say how sure you are? <laughs> so I actually think we should. There's a system looking at it. Um, it's really dumb that, health, that medical records don't have a way to modify a diagnosis as probable or possible. Um, that's a big deal. Um, and in fact, on the, those of you who know when you write a discharge summary, our coders send it back. If I write probable something, they send it back and say that's not billable. Um, and so I think we have to figure out ways to modify diagnoses because when we drop that probable possible maybe, it leads to a big issue. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Thank you. Um, I just want to, again, thank uh, Dr. Olson. I mean, this has been so inspiring for me. I hope it has been for you as well, and we can uh, bring this to our culture here at uh, Phoenix Children's. Please come back at 1130 today for our poster presentation and listening to some other um, projects that our colleagues have worked hard at to make care better at Phoenix Children's. So thank you again.